Hi friends, how are you? So we are going to talk about the best way to test paint colors. Gremlins are out tonight for live streaming. So this is a, we've had to do this a couple times, but that's all right. We're going to do it again. And I hope the audio is good this time. I'm actually going to scoot my microphone closer just to make sure that everything's okay. So testing paint colors. What is the best way to test the paint colors? Because uh, the existing color on the wall can influence your perception of the new color. And I'm going to click on comments here to make sure I don't miss anything this time. So if you have questions, you can ask me while we're talking and I can keep an eye on it. Actually, I have my email going too and someone email, emailed me earlier. So we're gonna hit that one again too. Hi friends, there's two people have joined. Um, we're, we're gonna give this another shot. We're talking about the best way to test your paint colors. Uh, and of course, we don't ever want to paint directly on the wall. Either get a sampleize, which is the sticker. You guys all know what sampleize is at this point. Or you can use a mighty board. I can show you what a mighty board looks like. Uh, this is a mighty board of white dove, and this is a mighty board of chantilly lace. Let me flip it around. It goes that way. Mighty boards are big, and they're bigger than the sampleize. So you have a couple of options to choose from. I also have swatch right, which is a circle shaped paint peel and stick color sample decal. But no matter what you're using, the existing wall color can be a problem. And one solution is to prime the wall before you test your colors. The problem with just using regular primer is that it comes in white. So we're gonna talk about why comparing white, uh, comparing colors to a white background is a problem. And we're going to talk about why you do not want a white border on your color sample later. But first, let's talk about what you can do to test your paint colors um, and block out that existing wall color. A good suggestion is to use primer. Again, we want to get the primer tinted. We do not want to use white. And I have some information for you about that. If you're going to prime the wall, if you're going to that trouble, just to preview color, then have your primer tinted because you can. Uh, from Sherwin-Williams, um, get their multi-purpose primer and you want to ask them to tint it to nebulous white, which is 7063. That's the color number. Nebulous white is a, a pretty darn true neutral gray from Sherwin-Williams. And you can get them to tint the primer to be a somewhat close match to it. Of course, it's never going to be an exact match because primer isn't a top coat. Primer doesn't behave like a top coat either when you put it on the wall. Uh, primer is going to be splotchy and it's not going to be completely uh, opaque. There's not going to be even opacity with the primer. Lots of people don't un understand that or expect that from a primer and they'll do two or three coats trying to get some color and hide build out of the primer and it's not going to happen because that's not what primer does. So you only need one coat of primer in almost every case. And the purpose of a primer is to seal the wall and uh, prepare the, the surface for the top coats because it's the top coats job to hide evenly and cover everything. So it's gonna be splotchy, but still uh, it will help, it will cover up the old color. And if you get it tinted, it will give you a reasonably neutral gray background to compare the colors. So it's nebulous white from Sherwin-Williams in their multi-purpose primer. If you're using Benjamin Moore, you want to get their Benjamin Moore Fresh Start Primer and you want it in the color Horizon 1478 because, again, that is a reasonably neutral color of gray from Benjamin Moore. Benjamin Moore, it's going to be a little different because there's only uh, room for two ounces of color in the Fresh Start Primer because it's not top coat, right? So there's not a lot of room for coloring, but they have some room to work with. They can tint the primer. And what they're going to do is they're going to take the court formula of Horizon 1478 and shoot that into the fresh start gallon uh, because the full <laughs> the full recipe for Horizon won't fit into the fresh start can. But you're still going to end up with a somewhat lighter color of Horizon Gray, but it will give you that neutral base for testing and comparing your, your paint colors. So never, never 
use white primer, you do not want white in the background of your colors if you have to cover up your existing color. A lot of people can see around the existing color and it's just not a problem for them. But if you're going to make the investment again in something like a Mighty Board, which is what I have here, or a sampleized sticker and you're gonna do it right, get it tinted, it doesn't cost anything. So those are my tips for testing colors, right? Don't do not do it on white <laughs> and whatever you do, um, you know, don't, don't leave a white border either. Just white is a bad thing. So if you're comparing chips and you are trying to see specific characteristics in a paint color, you do not want to put it on a white background. And the reason why we don't want to use white, and I have something to share with you too, um, is because white will make a color feel bigger and uh, bigger in mass and volume overall. And the other thing, at the same time, it's doing that. And uh, it also breaks the color. It weakens the colorfulness. So when you're looking at a color, whether it's a white background for chips or a white background on a wall, it is going to skew your perception of just how colorful that color is. You're going to think that it's not quite as strong as it actually is because it breaks the color. White breaks color in context. And I have something to share with you um, that's interesting. And you're going to find all kinds of um, similar links like this. Uh, I can tell you where I found this link. And I'm going to read it to you. It's really short. But um, like I said, you can find examples of people talking about this very same thing in, very, in different sources. So I got, I found this one at theartofpainting.be. And let me read it to you really quickly. Chevrel studied and then published a paper in 1839 on color theory that became quite influential. He called his Trista on the law of simultaneous contrast of colors. In this, he explained the effects of juxtaposing various color areas. Painters have used black next to colors often because, as Chevrel remarked, this improved the hue and brilliance of the colors. Black between colors also much annihilated the combinatory effects of the simultaneous contrast between the colors so that these colors kept their own hue. This method is sometimes called outlining. Such effects are not reached by separating colors with white. Hmm. The white subdues the colors by its brightness, which is enforced by the law of simultaneous contrast of tone. And this breaks the hues. Thus, black or dark tones in the background are the hallmarks of the greatest painters like Rembrandt, Titian, and Van Dyck. I'm going to start sharing. I'm going to stop sharing that. But that's very interesting. You know, it's um, basically we've known for a really long time <laughs> that white can skew your perception of color. And in the case of testing paint colors, it, or evaluating paint colors, it's really kind of evil. And you don't want a white background. Um, so where do we want to go next? What else did I want to tell you? Instead of a white background, what are you supposed to do? Instead of white, white's easier, right? Because white, you know, a white background, white primer, it's easier. It takes some effort to get a neutral background. I always have a neutral gray yoga mat in the back of my car. <laughs> It goes with me everywhere. I actually have two. And um, I use the yoga mat because when I'm on site working for builders or in somebody's home and we want to pull out samples, you know, the backs of tile or those big stone samples and stuff, I mean, they're heavy and they can really do some damage to the table that we're working on. So that's number one reason why I have a yoga mat with me. We lay everything out on it, but it's neutral gray. You can find a bunch of neutral gray yoga mats on um, Amazon. It makes a great work service and they're not technically totally neutral gray but they're gray and it's a heck of a lot better than white for sure and so we lay everything out on a neutral gray uh yoga mat uh when i'm on site working and again like i told you before if you have to do it on the wall you can just get your your primer tinted um tinted gray but if you don't have a color muse right or a device 
where you can measure color and then read the LCH hue angle and then go look it up and see what hue family it belongs to. If you're trying to eyeball what hue family colors belong to the analog way <laughs> you, and you, you know you don't want to use white because it's not going to help you out in that case, you want to get uh, a set of hue parent paint chips. And this is always good to have in your back pocket in case you can't use your device for some reason um, and you need a little, you feel like you need some support in identifying the characteristics of a color. Again, we're not comparing it to a white background. What you want to do is you want to lay the 10 hue parents out, the 10 hue parent chips out, and then you can compare your colors against the hue parent. And I'll tell you what, it's kind of crazy how when you go down the line with your near neutral chip or whatever it is that you're trying to place into a hue family, how quickly you can see that hue parent child color relationship. It's kind of freaky. It's actually kind of fun to do, right? It's a fun exercise to do. And I actually give you um, a worksheet in the four pillars of color course, and I can show you that right now too. So this is what the worksheet looks like. I'll hold it up. Can you see that? See all of those empty squares? Well, what we do is I give you a set of the chips, and this is a little bag that it comes in. And these are all paint chips from, ben, uh, from Dent Edwards. And you cut out the squares from all of the chips that I give you, and then you glue them on where they go. And so this is a tactile, hands-on exercise. So you can get a feel for how child colors fall into their hue parent categories and you get used to seeing that relationship and that harmony. And I'm going to show you um, what the worksheet <clears throat> looks like when it's done. And I'm going to have to go open it up. So give me just a second. So this is what the completed worksheet pretty much looks like. I have um, circles for the child colors because, you know, I designed it for an, to be an infographic, but the, the actual worksheet are squares. So let me make sure you guys can see this and you can. So this is the Hue Parents Child Colors Worksheet. Again, this is the blank one that you get in your course kit. And this is the, the little bag of chips. All of these chips that you see here are in this bag. And then you can put it together and it's a hands-on exercise. And then you can see uh, firsthand uh, how it works, how putting the child colors, the tint, tones and shades into the categories of hue parents make complete hue families. And then it makes sense, right? So, and then uh, also in the course kit, you get uh, the hue parents. And if you want to go order the full size sheets, the full size uh, paint samples, you can. And then of course, you can lay them all out if you need to do it the analog way, trying to figure out, match up what uh, Hue family each near neutral belongs to. Or if you have a textile or if you have a tile and for whatever reason, you can't just measure it and pull the Hue angle off of the app. You can use the Hue parent system approach to identify what that uh, core Hue family is for that color. So let me show you the list of Hue parents that you get uh, in the course because I give you this too. And of course, on that worksheet that I just showed you, all of those Hue parents are from Dunn Edwards and all of the paint chips, all of the colors. They're all actual paint chips. This isn't theoretical or just a, a worksheet. Uh, everything uh, is tied back to some kind of a color atlas. In this case, the color atlas is the Dunn Edwards fan deck. Cause you know, a fan deck is a color atlas, right? <laughs> because it's a color atlas because every color in there has a C-Lab color value. So let me show you what the list of Hue parents looks like from um, other brands, specifically Sherwin-Williams and um, Benjamin Moore. Okay, let me share this one and Again, this is a PDF that you can only get in the Four Pillars of Color course. But uh, if you want to take a screenshot and blow it up, you can do that. You know, that's fine. I am going to read it to you. <clears throat> I'm going to go down the list really quickly if you want. And um, maybe I'm not. <clears throat> Actually, I can't. 
So I will put a link to this PDF so you can uh, see what the Hugh parents are in Sharon Williams and Benjamin Moore if you want to collect those chips and try um, laying them all out and then matching up different paint chips to it so you can eyeball it and see what Hugh family it belongs to. But again, it's it's fun to do. Uh, it's a fun exercise, but if I had to do that every day as a means to getting my job done, I think I would probably lose my mind <laughs> because all you have to do is like measure it. All you have to do is go to the paint color DNA table and look it up. I, you know, shuffling paint chips has never been, has never been attractive to me. And, and, you know, I just, it's just not necessary. Okay. So I told you about the Hugh parents. I showed you the worksheet and the Hugh, if you need to do an analog, how you can actually shuffle the paint chips of, of uh, you know, with the Hugh parents and see what you get. <clears throat> the other thing I wanted to talk about was um, Carolyn had asked me about my color wheel and she wanted to know if these were real paint colors. And yes, these Hugh parents are real paint are real colors too. And if you were to take a device and measure my color wheel, you are going to get the hue angle. It's going to be very close, super close. And, but it's not going to be exact. And that's because I was limited by the range of colors that we could uh, use to print at the printer. So we got really close with the hue parents and all of the colors on my color wheel, like super close. And I suggest you do, if you have a device, measure color tools measure them and see what you're working with. And if you measure my color wheel, it is exactly what you see. What you see is what you get with my color wheel. And um, so yeah, Carolyn, they are real colors. They could be real colors. Obviously they're real colors and ink colors. In paint colors, I showed you the list of the Hugh parents from Dunn Edwards, Benjamin Moore and Sharon Williams, real colors. In terms of the C-Lab color space, which are which are the degrees on the outside, those are real colors too. Those can be made into real colors too. Here's the C-Lab fan deck. There's actually a fan deck for the C-Lab color space, right? So when, when, I, when I say that there's a color atlas with tangible colors that relate to this framework that I talk about all the time of hue parents, they're real colors and it applies to... Uh, everything. It can apply to paint colors. It can apply to textiles or tiles or, or ink or printing. It's, that's why I say when it's used by every industry across the globe that you can name, it really truly is. It really truly is. So those, that's the story of my color wheel and the Hugh parents. And um, I'll, I guess I'm putting a link now to the PDF so you can see the Hugh parents from Sherwin Williams and Benjamin Moore. When I did this before, someone had seen my Mighty Boards. These are Mighty Boards. This is a Mighty Board of White Dove. This is a Mighty Board of Chantilly Lace. I don't typically paint boards. I don't shuffle, and then they're slipping right now. I don't, I don't, I don't schlep paint. I don't schlep paint samples. I travel really light. The reason why I have some boards is because in the White Dove case, it was a pretty big house out in Queen, Queen Creek, Arizona. Everything was going White Dove. The cabinets were going White Dove. The doors, the trim, everything was going White Dove. So I painted a sample. So yes, I use Mighty Boards when I need to. I use sampleized samples when I need to. I, you know, I max, I leverage whatever color tool I need to leverage whenever I need to leverage it. But uh, for my normal process, I don't do samples. I don't, I don't do that. But when I do, right, for this one, I will do, we'll talk about white dove in particular. So this is my color wheel, right? This is how I label. This is how I label my sample boards. I have the notation, the Munsell notation on top, the hue angles right here, LRV, the color name and number. And this is a three inch color strategist color wheel. And do you see the little gray dot over here? I got these gray transparent stickers from a planner supplier person on Etsy. So they're neutral gray and they're transparent. And I use that to mark the location of the Hue family 
for my painted samples. And again, this is White Dove. So why do I do this? If I'm using sample boards, I need a quick reference. So I don't have to think because I'm thinking about other things. So I try to make it as easy for myself as I possibly can, which is why I do the little color wheel on my boards with the dot and my label. The thing about this information on these sample boards is no one else knows what they mean but me, right? So if my client is, if I, they're taking the white dove board and they're carrying it around and they're looking at it, which is what they do, which is fine, because the mighty boards are very durable, I can actually wipe this off, which is another reason, you know, the, the edges don't get dog-eared, but they do wear out which is one thing about sample boards that I don't like. It's like, it's such an investment, um, you know, to do these, to make these, and they do not last forever. So you're either throwing them away and making new ones or you have to repaint them, which is another reason why I don't include any kind of sample board system in my process. That's why I do everything digitally and only do boards when I have to. This isn't a daily tool for me. It's special. But when I, when I label them like this, no one else knows what it means. So, um, you know, how do I talk about this? I don't know how to talk about this diplomatically, but I'm going to try. Uh, several of my Camp Chroma students have shared with me before that one of the issues with labeling uh, color tools like sample boards like this is, yeah, have to be able to talk about the information that your client can see. So if we have just the notation, like I said, no one else knows what this means, but me. So if it shows up grayish, right? This is white dove and white dove can sometimes show up kind of dull and grayish and it belongs to the yellow hue family, which I can see and I can, you know, and I know that I don't want necessarily my client to know that it belongs to the yellow hue family because what if it shows up completely not yellow, Right. What if it shifts and goes a little green? Because, you know, it could based on where it lives in three dimensional color space. You see where it is in the yellow hue family kind of approaching the green yellow hue family right here. You know, for white dove to show up kind of grayish and greenish, that's that's not out of character. But I don't want to have to have a discussion about why my board said it belongs to the yellow hue family then. You know what I mean? It's like I know why it looks greenish and grayish. We don't have to have a whole color theory session discuss, discussing that, right? So I have it coded and you can actually, I, I sell these, these labels of, I don't even know how many colors, maybe 300 colors at this point. This is what they look like. This is what the labels look like. I pulled those out after the last live when someone asked me, no, oh, and there's Bailey. She has something to say too. So you can buy the labels and wear uh, the list of colors that I include in my labels came from is my students in Camp Chroma. They have purchased products and they've taken other courses. And I encourage people to do that. You should take as many color courses as you can. But when they get to my course and they find out about the framework of color notations and descriptions, they're like, how can I salvage my investment and um, salvage what the tools that I've invested in, how can I salvage that? So I don't have to deal with discussions with my client that I don't want to have. And so that's why I made the labels and um, they sent me the list of colors that they wanted to salvage. And um, so, yeah, you can go buy the labels there. And Bailey is working for some reason. I don't know why. The gremlins have just been out tonight for this, this live stream and I did not give up. So she's now barking and um, I'm going to wrap it up because I don't think she's going to stop you guys. But I think I'm done anyway. And we talked about using primer, how it's going to be splotchy. And if you're going to prime, at least get it tinted. Don't, don't waste your time just painting the white out of the can and never compare your chips against a white background because it is going to weaken the chromaticity and you're going to underestimate just how colorful it really is. So, okay. If you guys have any questions, just let me know. Um, I can see it in the comments and I can get back to you. So, hey, thanks for listening, everyone. And I'll talk to you maybe again later this week or definitely next week.
And I don't know what's up with Bailey, but I'm going to go see. Thanks for being with me, you guys. Bye.